Grace and peace, my friends, I am overwhelmed by God's grace and God's mercy that has enabled me to be here on this new year with you to begin this four-part series on identity based on the ancient book of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is a prophet who was sent in his youth um, to the nation of Israel. This nation and this people who began when God came to a 75-year-old man by the name of Abraham, who was childless and promised him that he would be the father of a nation whose number would be so numerous it would be as the stars of the sky or as the sand of the sea. And this man waits for 25 years for the fulfillment of this prophecy. And when he's 100 years old, he and his 90-year-old wife conceive a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has two sons of his own, Esau and Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons of his own. These sons eventually grow up and they go down to Egypt because of a drought. When they were in Egypt, they grow to a nation of two million people. The king of that land becomes insecure and faithful and fearful about those people and he enslaves them and they become slaves for 400 years. After 400 years, they call out to God. And God in his providence and in his mercy hears them and raises up a man by the name of Moses. Moses leads them out of Egypt. They spend 40 years wandering in the desert cause of sin and eventually they enter into the promised land. Now hear this, when they get to the promised land, they see all the nations around them, they look at what the nations are doing, they look at what the other people are doing and they notice that all these other nations have men as kings. So these people, this nation, Israel, turns its back on God as king and they demand that God gives them a man as king over them. God honors their request. He raises a man by the name of Saul who begins well as king but eventually rejects God and turns back, turns against God. God in turn rejects him as king and chooses another man by the name of David. David proves to be a man after God's own heart. He seeks after God for the entirety of his life and he rules Israel, God's nation, God's people for 40 years. As a result of his faithfulness and his passion and his zeal for God, God promises that he's children, his son, his seed would always sit on the throne of Israel. As a result, David's son, after him, Solomon, becomes king. He begins well, but he also turns against God. He rejects God, and God almost takes the kingdom away from him, but for the sake of his servant David, that's what he told Solomon, he spares Solomon and allows him to continue to rule as king for 40 years. When Solomon dies, hear this, his son Rehoboam becomes king. But now, hear this, Rehoboam was a foolish king. The foolishness of this king caused the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, to divide into two separate kingdoms. Ten tribes formed one kingdom called Northern Israel. The other two, Judah and Benjamin, formed what is known as the Kingdom of Judah. Now hear this. Now, uh, Every king after Jeroboam, but let me say, the vast majority of the kings that ruled over Israel after, after Rehoboam were evil men, evil kings who not only turned their backs on God, they led the Israelites, the nation of Israel, against God to turn back, turn against God. As a result, hear this. Approximately 700 years before the birth of Christ, a nation by the name of the Assyrians invaded northern Israel, took the ten tribes as 
captives and as slaves. They took every man, every woman, and every child as slaves back to Assyria as a result of them rejecting God and turning against God. Now, uh, all, the, all that was left was the kingdom of Judah. The two tribes are left, and it is to these tribes, to this kingdom of Judah, that Jeremiah is sent. Jeremiah, hear this, is a heartbroken prophet with a heartbreaking message. Jeremiah, listen, labors for 40 years proclaiming a message of doom to the stiff-necked people of Judah. Despised and persecuted by his countrymen, Jeremiah baths his harsh prophecies in tears of compassion. His broken heart causes him to write a broken book. That's what Jeremiah is. He spends 40 years reaching out to this nation, trying to draw them back to God before what happens to the ten tribes, northern Israel, happens to Judah. Jeremiah is a contemporary, listen, of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Daniel, and Ezekiel. All right? So all of these prophets have come before Jeremiah to speak a message to the Israelites to come back to God, to draw back to God. But these people are stiff-necked and they refuse to listen. The words of Jeremiah, son of Helkiah, of the priests who were in Anoth in the land of Benjamin. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until, listen, the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. All right? So the captivity has already happened to northern Israel. And so Jeremiah is sent to the remaining two tribes, the kingdom of Judah, to try and keep them from that calamity, that disaster that happened to their countrymen as a result of rejecting God, turning away from God. And I want you to notice, watch here. Now, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, listen, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Note, my friends, how God right off the bat in, this, uh, in the ministry of Jeremiah makes identity the focal point of Jeremiah's call. He wants Jeremiah to be aware of his identity. Why? Because Jeremiah spends the next 44 chapters in a 52 chapter book talking to the people about their identity with God and in God and trying to draw them back to this identity. Jeremiah is trying to bring these people back to God. Listen to this. I will utter my judgments, Jeremiah 16. Let me finish by saying this. This is just the intro. I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. So let me close out this intro, this first part of this four-part series, by saying this. Here it's, this is what it's all about, okay? For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, turned, back, turned against the source of their identity, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have made for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Hear this again. For my people have committed two evils. 
They have turned back against me. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. So they have uh, rejected the source of life, the source of their identity, and they have attempted to create their own source. And that source becomes broken. They are an identity crisis. There is no identity, my friend away from God. Let me say that again. There is no identity without God. Anything, anyone who tries to live life apart from God will always be in identity crisis. They will never know who they are. They will live their whole life seeking after things to fill out a vac to fill out a hole in a vacuum in their lives, but that hole and that vacuum can only be filled by God. This is the identity series. Part two. Coming next week. Shalom.